Hey everyone, I'm Rod Roddenberry, and you're listening to Trek FM. Hello and welcome to Stage 9, Trek FM show about the people who make Star Trek. I'm Mike. I'm John. And today we're going to be talking about the documentary by Star Trek director Adam Nimoy about Star Trek director Leonard Nimoy for the love of Spock. Yes. But first, let's talk about some news, shall we? Some important news, Mike. So, uh, Michael Piller... Back in the day, he wrote a movie called Star Trek Insurrection. It uh, came out in theaters. It did. People saw it. I, I, I was one of them. I, was, one of I them. was, too. I went to one of the midnight showings. I didn't see it until the Saturday after it came out, which talk, you know, it, it really sort of like speaks to where I was at in my Star Trek fandom back then. That I did not I go to see this on, on opening day. It's so strange. Anyway... Yeah. It was an interesting uh, piece of filmmaking, which maybe had some challenges behind the scenes. And yes, uh, challenges that maybe had been detected by fans uh, when they viewed it, that there were some compromises made along the way. Yes, and uh, Michael Piller being the smart individual that he is, uh, while writing the movie, also uh, kept some rather detailed notes about the creation of of the movie. And he wrote a book called Fade In, The Making of Star Trek Insurrection, which chronicles his process and his experience making the film. Now, this book has become the stuff of legend, and uh, it's... Uh, one of those things which was, I, I think, you know, a lot of people think it, 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 it might be better than the movie itself because it's, you know, a, a look at the process from beginning to end. Right. As as chronicled by, you know, one of the guys who saved Star Trek, one of the guys who you can legitimately say saved Star Trek, Right. Yes. And uh, I think that that's really, really interesting. And it's uh, ha- has never been published, uh, despite the fact that he wrote it, you know, well, at this point, boy, 18 years ago. All right. That's, cool. yeah, wow. Yeah. Time is relentless, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, but now, finally, it is getting published. Uh, his wife, Sandra Piller, has uh, been trying to get this book in a place where it's it, you know get, to give it a, a proper release and it's finally happening uh she's publishing it and it's on sale now you can go buy it she's been doing the convention circuit uh i actually saw her her table at um vegas like as the convention was closing because she was in the the autograph room and okay I didn't really go into the autograph room at all because, you know, it's it's not really my scene. But right. uh, Larry Nemechek was, was in that room. And I, you know, stumbled in it to, to, like, say hi to him, like, at the very end. And, I like, as I'm waiting to, like, talk to him, um, I, I, I look over and I see this, this table, which has been, you know, abandoned because most of the tables were, were abandoned at that point because the con was closing up in a matter of minutes and I see all these like flyers and it was Sandra Pillar's booth and she was you know selling this book and she had like all of these these flyers about the book just you know sitting there so I grabbed it and I'm like oh my god this is this is amazing it's actually coming out who knew yeah. and Pillar uh, was very much into sort of like teaching the next generation of writers yeah, uh, about yes. about the craft and everything, and and I, it sounds like you know based on the the interview that that Pillar Sandra Pillar gave on Star Trek dot com that you know one of his reasons for writing this book was to teach you know s- aspiring screenwriters sort of about the process beyond just the actual writing of the script. Right. And and because of this, you know, he saw this as as sort of a textbook, and it's being released 
as a textbook. It's it's a, a massive volume, hardcover, you know, and and uh, it includes some new essays by Iris Stephen Bear and uh, Eric Stillwell, who uh, we've had on on commentary Trek stars. Yes, yes, very. Uh, you know, this is a book that is the stuff of legend. People have talked about it for you know, a very long time. And just the idea that it's uh, getting a proper release is fantastic. I think it's great. I I mean, I encourage everybody to go on over. I mean, you know, Pillar, I mean, we we did a whole series on him on Commentary Trek Stars. And, you know, he did, like you said, he loved mentoring people. He loved sharing the process and, you know, exposing people to, you know, every part of it. And so this is... I. I love this type of stuff. I mean, it's great. It's like when the the it's like when the annotated screenplays for Star Wars came out. Like that, it was so fascinating because there was so much stuff about the process, and you I, I, you know it really shines a light. And I imagine this book does. I don't know, but like, it's really cool when they shine a light on uh, the the fact that filmmaking is a compromise at every step of the way. You know, it's never exactly what you want from concept to screen. You have to make an allowance for that. And so personally, I can't wait to pick up a copy and read this because this is, you know, this is something that's been referenced and spoken about. And I, I look forward to reading this. This is a a very anticipated release. Yeah. And, and I imagine, you know, even more than like an annotated screenplay, like, you know, from, from star Wars or whatever, that, that this is going to be even, even cooler in a sense, because it's firsthand information. Like this is, straight from you know the writer's pen you know and and uh it's it's something which uh was done almost immediately uh, upon uh release of the film which means that it's all fresh it's not something which is being remembered years after the fact or anything like that it's you know right there you know firsthand account almost like a journal of of the creation of this thing so that's that's pretty awesome and yeah uh, it's it, it it's definitely something which I I'm I'm looking forward to to seeing. Now, yeah, absolutely. Now the price tag it's a bit steep. It's ninety five bucks, but you know yeah for textbooks. Yeah, I mean no, honestly, I, I I mean this honestly. Look at look at your shelf, everybody, including myself. Everybody, look at your shelf. There is something on there that you spent about that much on that you look at and it's collecting dust right now. And you look at it and you say. Eh, maybe maybe I didn't need to buy that. Maybe I don't even need to hold on to it. But this is a book, like you said, straight from Pillar's pen. You know, th- this isn't this isn't a retrospective. This isn't somebody going back and and reviewing the script and interviewing people and making like an oral history. This is the person who did it telling you firsthand what happened. Well worth the price. Hey, you know what I'm looking at right now? What's that? Season two of Star Trek The Next Generation. <laughs> I spent a hundred dollars on it. Now season three is right there too, same price, but that one I'm okay with buying because Michael Pillar wrote it, you know. So yeah, well, you know, it's you, you got to make uh, uh, allowances there. Yeah, there there are definitely plenty of things. I'm not going to list them off, but there are plenty of things where I look around and I, I haven't always spent very wisely. Yeah, so you know, yeah. it's, it's one of those things that happens. Yeah. So, yeah, it's available now. Uh, go to michaelpillar.net and pick up your copy. And, uh, yeah, be the coolest kid on your block. Yes, or at least the most informed about Star Trek Insurrection. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yes. All right. Well, should we move on to our feature presentation? Let's move on to our feature presentation, Mike. Okay. So there was a new movie that came out uh, on Friday, September 9th. Yes. That movie is For the Love of Spock, a documentary uh, directed by Adam Nimoy about his father, Leonard Nimoy, and his father's most famous character, Spock. Yes. So, Adam Nimoy, I mean, I guess, you know, we should we should preface this by saying that Adam Nimoy himself is a Star Trek director. Yes, and, he is. And honestly, that's one of the reasons why I was looking forward to this documentary so much, you know, because, you know, anyone can make a documentary about Spock, you know, and any kid can make a documentary about their their parent, you know. I mean, it's certainly been done a million times before. But the idea that it was directed by the guy who made Rascals 
really yeah. kind of made me happy. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know what you think about the episode of Rascals, or even if you remember the episode of Rascals. Mm-hmm. I love that episode for, you know, I guess unique and personal reasons. You remember Rascals? The one where they turn into kids? Yes. Yes. I I, I even remember the one where they uh, lovingly made fun of it in a very subtle way on uh, Futurama. Oh, I don't remember that. But yeah. 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 I, see, the thing about Rascals, like I was the age of the that the characters turn into when mm-hmm. it aired. So, like, to me, as someone who basically spent all of my time watching Star Trek and the time that I wasn't watching Star Trek, I was just sort of imagining what it would be like to be on Star Trek. Sure. You know, to then see, like, kids my age getting to do that, you know, wearing their little uniforms and everything like that. Like, I I just loved that. It, it It was great, and it was a lot of fun because it's like, this is something that I could do. You know, I'd be like Alexander or whatever, you know, and, and that was really cool. And also, um, you know, it, it was one of those things where I was like 13 years old and my sister is much younger than me. So she was only like six and I would be watching Star Trek nonstop, you know, 24 seven. And my sister really wasn't having any of that. And, you know, this was like the one episode because it was, you know, about, you know, little kids or whatever, where I could be like, do you want to watch Star Trek, Mary? And she'd be like, no. And I'd be like, how about the one where they turn into kids? And she'd be like, okay. You know, and even if you were to ask her, you know, to this day, like, do you watch Star Trek or you, what Star Trek do you remember from, you know, the countless hours of your, your brother watching watching this show? She'd be like, well, there's the one where they turn into kids, you know? So it, there you it, go. it has that, I have that personal connection to it. But I also think it's a pretty badass episode, I have to say. Uh, it's not in my top 10, but no. I don't have anything, I don't have anything against it. It's not like, uh, oh, I always just call it Riker's Brain. I forget the name of that episode. He, the other episode that he directed is Timescape, which is the one where like they beam, like Picard and Troy like beam back onto the ship. I think Data's with them too. And like everything is like, frozen but then they start going crazy and then like picard like draws the smiley face in the in like the warp core eruption oh yeah oh oh he directed that one (laughs) yeah okay yeah Yeah, i remember smiley face sure yeah 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 you know uh, uh, here here this is going to be showing you know for all you youngsters out there watching your hd blu-rays of of star trek next generation uh, i lived on the poor side of town and we didn't have the good cable because the rich people Mm -hmm. all got the good cabling for for the cable so when we watched wpwr power 50 in oak park illinois on the south side um you know we were sort of at the mercy of uh you know how good the signal was going to be that day oh yes yeah i did i didn't live uh in in South Side Chicago, I lived in the hinterlands. And yeah. so cable TV was when we finally got it, which was very, very far along in my teenage years. <laughs> um, I, I think I, I think I understand what you're you're saying, where the signal was some days like, well, this is cable. Why do I have to yeah. contend with this? Right. Why yeah. is this even even to this day? I'm like, why would it change? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And usually Channel 50 was very, very fuzzy. So, like, yeah. I remember watching that episode the day that it aired because it aired the the day that I went to my first Star Trek convention. Hey, um, <laughs> we came home and watched Timescape, you know, live. And um, that scene where, like, Picard, like, points to the smiley face, I remember thinking, like, what's he laughing at? Because I couldn't see the freaking smiley face through the <laughs> static on my TV. <sighs> That's great. Anyway, but yeah. I got the joke once I got the DVDs, you know, so years later. Anyway, um, so Adam Nimoy, director, yes. you know, very good director in his own right. And here he's making a documentary about his dad. Um, so, yeah. Uh, why I, I don't know. I mean, I guess we kind of gave a synopsis of it. Yeah, I, d- I don't think that you can really give more of a synopsis than that. I mean, it, it's a very, it's a, 
it's just under two hours, um, and it's a very complete look at uh, Leonard Nimoy's life and you know his, his time as Spock. And it's important to note, uh, they note it very early on, that they had started the project while uh, Leonard Nimoy was alive. Yeah. And, and then he died. And so, like, that, uh, by Adam Nimoy's own admission, he said it sort of changed the nature of the documentary. And so it goes into some very... Um, it, it goes into some very personal territory. Like, it, it really is revelatory, even if you've been a longtime fan of Star Trek. And this is the thing is it what's tough I think in some regards is there are of course uh portions of it where if you've been a Star Trek fan of long standing you know you, you kind of like oh yes we you know I I kind of know this that's okay but what's nice about it is that he he splits up the telling of the tales especially the familiar ones by having you know Walter Koenig start the sentence and George Takei finish the sentence and then Nichelle Nichols follow it up so that you don't get bogged down in that sort of, um, you know, same old story sort of mentality that can happen with something like this because there's already a lot of material out there. And so I think that it walks a very fine line in terms of keeping the material that you know fresh. Yeah, that's true. I mean, and and there are, you know, a lot of like little tidbits, which, you know, you you haven't heard before and, you know, kind of like take you by sure. surprise. I mean, like the thing that, that I, I was like, wow, that, you know, and I mean, I guess I had kind of heard this, but I thought it was just insane, you know, where like basically, you know, Nimoy was, he realized that, you know, Star Trek wasn't going to last 50 years. Are you crazy? So, you know, he wanted to, to, take advantage of that property for as long as he could, you know, to, to provide some sort of financial stability for his family. Yeah. So the idea that he'd never turned down like a paying gig and you Mm -hmm. see some of the stuff that they had him do and it's like, Oh my God. And I guess like that was a thing. Like you see pictures of like Adam West at parades and stuff like that. But just the idea of like these, this town is having a parade they want Spock, you know, to, you know, ride in the parade. Okay, you know, so let me fly yeah. to this place and do this. And it's like, that's so weird. Like, can you imagine that happening now? Uh, no, not really. It's, it's a completely <laughs> not, different not really. world. A compl- well, Although I guess conventions it, are sort of the equivalent of that now. Conventions are the equivalent, but I, I'd also say that there is a, um, you know, especially with, uh, like, the era that the the original Star Trek existed in, no, there wasn't the thought of like we'll be wor- we'll be working with this for fifty years. It was this is a gig, it's gonna run out, and uh, so you, you know they, they wouldn't have even like nowadays you'd be uh, negotiating merchandising rights. You know yeah. if Star Trek comes up to you and is like we want you to be in Star Trek, all right, I want half a percent of the net fig- action figure sales or something like that. You know that didn't happen, and uh, you know and it's really. Because, um, you know, the tale has been told many times about, you know, how the merchandising, how Paramount was just making tons of money. But it was really interesting. It's the first time I'd heard it from Nimoy himself in the context of the documentary about the fact that he realized that Paramount had been selling his likeness for, you know, years without even telling him and had stopped even forwarding the checks to him. And, you know, he suddenly realized he was like, "Wait, wait a minute wait a minute that's not right and like i i just i it, it's fun to hear that i mean you know it's a, it's an unfortunate story but it's still fun to hear it because nimoy was such a good natural storyteller that to have those clips of him you know he sort of laughs about it where he's like oh that's so foolish how, do, how could i let that one slide you mm-hmm. know and it, it's fun to hear that and then to see the the archival clips of of him you know like like they they were talking about how this was sort of like holding up uh, him signing on to do Star Trek the motion picture you know because there was like an ongoing you know uh, legal battle which was trying to be settled and then you know you 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 see the clip of him at the press conference or whatever after he signed on to be in the movie and a reporter asks him you know the question and the answer that he gives you know 
which is yes. like, well, we've had a very uh, interesting relationship with Paramount, and I guess the, mm-hmm. the biggest factor was that it takes a, a very long time for the mail to get from here to Vulcan, you know? I mean, that's like, that's like a great response, you know? But it, it's also interesting, you know, now to hear the backstory and then to see that response, you know, it's, it plays a lot differently than it would... You know, well, back there, in the day. Well, uh, there, there's also a sensibility now where when somebody feels they're, they've been wronged by the studio or whatever, they'll come out guns blazing and yeah. torch them in the press. I mean, just look at what Shia LaBeouf just did. Yeah. And, you know, like Nimoy was old school and it was a different time where it was like, OK, everything's fine. We're not going to talk about that anymore. We're just mm-hmm. going to keep moving. Yeah. You know, there, there seems to be like a thing which... I guess it's just natural to happen, you know, for documentaries because people are going to be, you know, making very, very personal stories. But there's a number of them that I can think of where it's, you know, children making movies about not not only just their famous parents, but, you know, lots of times their famous, like, artist parents or, or you know, filmmaker parents. You know, there's this one, I mean, there's... There's the the Rod Roddenberry documentary, Trek Nation, about Gene Roddenberry. Uh, Another one which is, you know, not Star Trek related is Tell Them Who You Are about uh, um, Haskell Wexler, which is very, very good. Um, But but this one, you know, it's another one, you know, sort of like in that sort of vein or that genre. And, you know, these tend to be really interesting because... It's like everyone, I'm sure everyone listening to this is a huge fan of Spock and and Leonard Nimoy and Leonard Nimoy because of Spock. And we all have um, an idea of who that guy was based on based on their public persona. And to get a very, very unique perspective of that person from like one of the few, like like handful of people on the earth who had a different relationship with him than the world is yeah. really interesting. You know, I, I completely agree. You know, I, I very much applaud the documentary for going into uh, painful territory and not, you know, it, it's very unvarnished in certain respects. He's very honest about the difficulties that he had in his relationship with his father. Um, and it's really fascinating because the, one of the, the framing devices on his section is he reads a letter that his father wrote to him back in the seventies. And it's, it's amazing because it's, it's the type of letter that I can just imagine how difficult it was to feel like you have to write something like that. So yeah, on the whole, this is a very good documentary. Uh, It's available right now on iTunes and Amazon and all the rest of it. Uh, You can also, uh, if you're lucky, find it in a theater near you. All right. Well, it's been fun talking about For the Love of Spock today, but that's not the only thing we're talking about here on Trek FM this week. So here's a look at what you may have missed elsewhere on the network. Previously on Trek.FM, The Ready Room. You know, Pushing Daisies and Hannibal are two very different shows, but they both have a very strong visual look and a very strong storytelling style and and a point of view and one is quirky and one is darkly quirky and one is whimsically quirky literary treks she just does such amazing things with these characters and it just consistently blows me away how invested i am in chakotay's life decisions i never ever thought that i would care two wits about what chakotay does with his life but i'm really invested here you know i really care about the decisions he's making and what's going to become of him in the future the 602 club but now by the third one you've got this really difficult task of like every sequel has you've got to be the same but different (laughs) <laughs> and you've got to build on the success of that character that has been so cemented now by two movies. So the little things that started to show up in the first two movies, the quips, the cool clothes, all of this stuff is exponentially blown up onto a much, much bigger scale in this movie. Saturday Morning Trek. And all these things just brought in more and more people who thought they were alone and they found each other and they made their clubs and they then they made conventions and that just that's what the seventies were about. 
was getting Star Trek back and finding each other. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out these shows and discover what we're talking about in your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe. You'll find us wherever we, you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button. That helps us out greatly and makes it easier for other listeners to find the show as they search iTunes. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our show on Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Windows Phone. And of course, you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website and grab the RSS link as well. Uh, we'd like to thank our associate producers, Jeff Sutter, Chris Steftenagel, and Norman C. Lau. Uh, thank you guys very much for helping us out, and uh, we really appreciate uh, your support. Um, if you want to become an associate producer like Jeff, Chris, and Norm, uh, go to patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm, uh, where you can uh, donate to help us keep our shows uh, up and running. There, you'll find all of our current goals and different milestone contribution levels, along with all the great perks we have for you. These perks include early access to content, exclusive content, producer credits, seats on our content development team, and more. We really appreciate any support you can give us and hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trek.fm. If you want to contact us, uh, head on over to Twitter at trek.fm, or over on Facebook at facebook.com slash trekfm. Uh, Facebook is where you'll also find the Babel Conference, which is our listener forum. Uh, just type the Babel Conference, that's B-A-B-E-L, into the search field in Facebook, or go to our website at trek.fm and click the discussion tab on the menu bar. Okay, well, that pretty much does it for this episode of Stage 9. We will be back next week with an audio commentary for the Mr. Pibb episode of American Dad, A.T., The Abusive Terrestrial.